1979, I, um, a friend of mine taught me how to build speaker cabinets, and I built a couple of them, put them in my car and drove them around and did parties for $30. Uh, and dances, high school dances and stuff at local um, amusement halls or wherever. And um, yeah, I've also learned to build speakers back then, so I've been built, building speakers ever since. I started, my very first tour was in 1985, I guess. My first real tour was 1985 with Black Flag on the Slip It In tour, and then 80, again in 85, and then 86, um, two more Black Flag tours. Before that, had done little stuff, like a little miniature tour of California with the Dead Kennedys, or with Social Distortion, San Diego, LA, San Francisco. Um, so I would say mid 80s. And then went on to do Chili Peppers and Blink-182. So, oh, the, the first real tour we did, other than Black Flag, was Sonic Youth, which was really cool, uh, on the Goo Tour. And I've been, I have toured up through 2017, so it was at um, mid-80s, 32 years of touring. Perfection is a non-existent reality. Um, great sound is just an opinion. And I think that's one of the most misunderstood, complicated, and also um, hard to comprehend, yeah, hard to comprehend aspects of sound is what is our purpose in sound? Are we out there to create perfect sound as far as a realistic recreation? Do we want it to sound exactly as it does in nature? But electronic guitars and drums and synthesizers don't exist in nature. So what is perfect for that? Um, do you want realistic sound? Do you want sound with the most impact? Do you want something that just purely attaches someone to emotion? Or do you want something that is distracting where you focus on the music or do you want something that is completely invisible where you have no idea uh, you don't notice it at all so there's no real answer to that um, I do believe that our purpose in sound reinforcement is to connect the artist with the audience and to create memorable experiences that people love to hold on to and if we can do that then you've done a very good job of getting close to the perfect sound and it doesn't matter if that's a sporting event or a political speech or a rock show or a dance club. As far as inventing or creating things, that's what I, that was the very first thing that I did. That's probably why I'm in this business in the first place is, you know, as a kid, I was always taking things apart and fixing them. And I originally wanted to do recording, be a, uh, a recording engineer, because I didn't even know there was sound. I didn't know you could, there was even a business of sound, live sound, right, as a little kid. And, um, a friend of mine taught me how to build speakers at this recording studio I was working at, and, and um, I was like, oh, this is fun, this is more exciting, you set it all up, you tear it down, stuff breaks, I get to fix it. So I started building my own speaker. So, Designing, conceiving, thinking of an idea of some, and then building it and then having it make sound has been one of the most exciting, fun things I've done and kept me uh, enjoying this for many years. And so uh, when I ended up being a sound engineer for various bands touring the world, I never wanted to be a sound engineer. I wanted to be a sound system designer. I wanted to be an inventor. Uh, my dream as a kid was being the dad in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you ever watched that movie, I wanted to be the dad in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang uh, and make Chitty Chitty Bang Bang the flying car. So that, that's, um, um, and so that's what I've been doing is I have the business of renting sound equipment and we have sales, we sell equipment and we have, um, the design side and the, the rental, the installations, we have all these departments, but for me, they all fuel the one central core, which is for 
me and the people at RAT to come up with innovative ideas and do fun, cool, new things. And whether it's a sound system design of how we're doing sound for a concert or actually designing the enclosures or building the sound tool stuff or the subwoofers, those are all centered around. It's all interwoven together. The XLR Snipper Sender actually came out, I was on tour with Rage Against the Machine and we were having troubles with the lead vocal mic and um, we were in the middle of this festival and it didn't work. I called up and said, vocal mic doesn't work and they, they went out and switched the mic on stage and I was at front of house and then it's like, still doesn't work and they switched the cable and it ended up taking a long time and we went on late because of it. And I started thinking, what if I had a device where I could just, they could just know when it works and tell me that it's fixed rather than having to keep calling me and asking me whether it works now and I had to stop what I'm doing of testing the other instruments, listen to it, check in the mic. This is the sniffer, we call it the sniffer because it sniffs. This is the sender because it sends. And when you plug them into each other, you'll see three lights, means it's good. The sender, the current version of the sender, actually you can unscrew it slightly and it acts like an on-off switch, if you want to have an on-off switch. Um, but even if you leave it on, the battery won't drain, and you can leave it unplugged. And the battery lasts for years if you don't leave it plugged in, if you're just using it for a test. Um, the cool thing about it is you can turn phantom power on every channel of a console, and then you can go up to a snake system, and you can just go check, 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 and phantom power, you know, if this phantom power is supplied to that, it would um, seem very quickly and easily test. Um, so this sender can be used as your source, or phantom power can be used for your source to test your cables. And then we started just expanding on that. We started making, um, um, what, what did we make after that? Well, we made an X, we made a um, quarter inch sniffer sender, and then a DMX sniffer sender. And um, NL4, I, re I redesigned the circuit for four lines, made an NL4 sniffer sender, same thing. Doesn't use any power, you can check NL4 lines. We have an NL8 sniffer sender coming out soon. Oh, and they're all the other thing about it is there's lots of testers out there, but um, most of the testers require you to have both ends of the cable. Let's see if the cable here. Uh, requires you to get both ends of the cable into the same spot to plug in. So if you have a cable that's run from front of house to stage that's 150 feet long or 300 feet long, you got to get another 300 foot cable and plug that in. And whereas this, you just plug, you have, you plug one in on one end, you plug the other side in on the other end, and you're able to uh, test cables in place without adding additional stuff. One of the biggest challenges of live performances is the actual venues that we're working in. I mean, inherently, if you really want it to sound great, you would play in a small club. And if you really want it to sound perfect, you'd put headphones on. And But if you put headphones on, then it's a personal experience. And people can listen to headphones and iPods at home. But people gather in groups to see a concert in order to experience the community experience of being together, to have a bunch of people synchronized in the same feeling, in the same focus. And the larger that is, the more powerful that has a possibility of being. So then, in order to really create an extremely overwhelmingly powerful experience, you get a lots and lots of people all focused on the same thing. Well, as you do that, you're in a bigger and bigger space. And as you're in a bigger space, if it's indoors, you've created all these acoustical reflections and reverberation issues. And if it's in a field, you've got... Um, outdoor weather concerns and wind and heat and all kinds of environmental factors. So it's a self-defeating. The better it gets with largeness, the worse it gets with audio coverage. Uh, what can we do to... There's also this affinity. Like I, my first concert I ever saw was Led Zeppelin at the Forum in uh, Los Angeles. And... It is no, was the forum is not a great sounding room. It's a big, 
echoey arena. But there's also coming back there later and mixing Soundgarden or Chili Peppers there, Rage Against the Machine. Coming into this big echoey room, there's a certain beauty to it as well. There's a certain excitement. The flaws to the room are part of the experience and part of the enjoyment. And so I don't know if it's about creating the perfect rock show as taking whatever environment you're in and optimizing it for the artist-audience connection that you desire to achieve. 